I'd like to uh, introduce our luncheon speaker. He's certainly not a stranger to the people in this audience today, uh, but as a gentleman that uh, has responsibility, as we heard yesterday, 1% one per one of the area of the Pacific is a uh, landmass. That, but the gentleman we have speaking with us today is the commander of the Indo-Pacific Command. And within that area of responsibility, when you look at the national defense strategy, you'll find that he's pretty well got it covered with the things that he's got to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And as I said, you, I'm not going to have to spend any time introducing this gentleman. I'd like to get him up here to speak in front of you. But at this time, I'd like to introduce Admiral Phil Davidson, the commander of the United States Indo-Pacific Command. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Aloha and good afternoon. Oh, come on, in Hawaii, it's aloha. aloha. Very good. Nice to see everyone today. Thank you, Bob, for the very kind introduction. And thank you once again to the Naval Institute and AFSEA International for hosting this conference. I can't believe the turnout here. This is just an incredible room. And to both Bob and Pete, it is always a pleasure to see you. And I commend your leadership in making this event so successful. Uh, before I continue, I'd like to acknowledge all of the brave wen men and women of our sea service that are deployed around the globe and in harm's way at this very moment. And I salute those preparing for deployment as well, soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardsmen alike. It is their service to our nation each and every day that they serve that truly makes the difference. As Bob intimated, we need to get right into it. So ladies and gentlemen, allow me to begin our discussion today with a history lesson pertaining to, believe it or not, the Army and the Air Force. However, in the end, I hope you will see it is a story about the future of the Joint Force and it has implications for our Navy Marine Corps and Coast Guard team as well. In the mid-1970s, the Army began to lift its head from its experience in Vietnam and re-examine its obligations in Europe. It found its position, poised as it was against the Soviet threat across the Fulda Gap. Well, they found that position as daunting as it had ever been. The United States defense construct, then called active defense in 1976, was such that U.S. troops in Western Germany, over 200,000 strong, would fight to not lose the so-called first battle. And they would do so by trading space for time. And by trading space, I mean seeding it. And that space was the territory of our allies. The calculus determined that this was the only pragmatic solution to fighting, that is to say, fighting outnumbered without rapidly escalating the fight or losing outright. It was a live to fight another day. The conventional wisdom at that time, based on World War I and World War II models, was that U.S. forces would mobilize, they would deploy to Europe, they would then join our allies in reclaiming their lost territory. Now, naturally, the possibility of this construct playing out upset the members of NATO, especially West Germany. After all, the purpose of the alliance was first and foremost to prevent war and to present a vision of how to fight without turning Allied territory into a twice contested battlefield, perhaps for the third time in a century. Active Defense's primary deficiency was that it did not account for the theater strategic and the alliance context of war in Europe. I hope you all know that Active Defense gave way to something much better. Active Defense soon led to the U.S. Army and Air Force's development of air land battle, which in brief, combined the U.S. Air Force's deep fires capability with the mobility of the Army's maneuver forces to attempt to deny Soviet objectives in a close fight and in a deep fight. 
Air land battle took advantage of our capabilities and also expanded on those in development to evolve the strategic approach for the European theater. And ultimately, it merged tactical development, our technology, and our training into a common doctrine for the joint force. In terms of tactical development, it is important to note that air land battle changed the existing theater warfighting concept from not losing the first battle to actually winning the most important one, defeating the Soviets' second echelon force. This was a critical change because it directly challenged the heart of the Soviets' military theory of victory. Second, I mentioned technology. Our advances in technology, such as the emerging intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance complex, and precision strike and navigation, not only filled known warfighting gaps, it also introduced new methods of striking and destroying that Soviet second echelon force. Third, air land battle developed and integrated new training concepts and capabilities. In what later became known as the training revolution, the Army took a lesson from the development of programs like the Navy's Top Gun during Vietnam and the Air Force's Red Flag series to create their own national training center and concept. Air land battles integration of tactical development, technology, and training demonstrated to our NATO allies and our adversary alike the capability, the capacity, and the will to deny Soviet objectives by imposing unacceptable cost on their conventional military forces. Air land battle provided the U.S. and NATO forces the strength and ability to deter Soviet aggression. Now, for those of us who are old enough to remember the value of a strong deterrent, there are many lessons to be learned here. One of those refreshers lies on the effectiveness of our deterrence strategy during the Cold War, as the principles of deterrence since then have not changed. Deterrence is only effective if the adversary believes a combat credible opponent force exists with the capability, the capacity, and the will to fight and win. And by definition, there are two types of deterrence, deterrence by punishment and deterrence by denial. Of course, there will always be an element of deterrence by punishment where the deterrent lies in the promise of punishment on the adversary, generally following the aggression. Our nation's strategic deterrent lies at the core of that element. But I think we can all agree that deterrence by punishment alone leaves few options should deterrence fail, and the consequences are enormous. The value of deterrence by denial comes in placing the burden on our adversary. We must convince them that the costs of their action to achieve their objectives by military force are simply too high. And in order to effectively deter, we need to arm our joint force again with the proper capabilities, the capacities, the authorities. Indeed, a resulting concept or doctrine one that supports rapid integrated joint force employment, accurate offensive power, and provides an effective defense. The National Defense Strategy charges us with revisiting the way we think about these last three decades of warfare. It is not very dissimilar to the challenges faced by those who led the transformation to air land battle. New geopolitical realities today Expanding warfighting domains and emerging technical capabilities are challenging the doctrinal status quo. The joint force must continue to transform its doctrine or we will have little to fall back on except our recent experience in counterinsurgency and constabulary operations. 
Today's transformation must be realized through the creation of a modern warfighting concept that can meet today's challenges. At the heart of it, our forces must be as maneuverable, agile, if you will, and have the depth of multi-domain fires needed to achieve positional advantage. It must leverage an array of interoperable and compatible allies and partners, and it must demonstrate it has the deterability, if you'll allow me that, to deny and defeat. Let me be clear, I'm not saying that the United States is facing a new Cold War, not at all. Containment is not part of our strategy like it was in the Cold War. However, like the Cold War, we must be doing everything possible to deter a fight. And, and, we must be prepared to fight and win should competition turn to conflict. I know that I am speaking to an audience that is well-versed in your understanding of the military threat China presents. So today, let me focus for just a moment on China's strategic threat to the idea of a free and open Indo-Pacific. I say it quite frequently, the Communist Party of China represents the greatest long-term strategic threat to security in the 21st century, not only in the Indo-Pacific, but to the entire globe. The Communist Party of China is actively seeking to supplant the established rules-based international order in order to dictate new international norms and behaviors and ultimately new relationships to the region. Indeed, this very public goal is to establish norms that are driven, guided, and enforced by the party in Beijing. Beijing's approach is pernicious. The party uses coercion, influence operations, and economic, military, and diplomatic threats to bully other states to accommodate the Communist Party of China's interests. These actions often directly undermine the sovereignty of other nations and threaten regional stability. Its direct threats to First Island Chain nations persist. Its development of multi-domain capabilities across its joint force continue. Its deployment of capability continues to move farther afield and across the globe. In pursuit of its vision, the Communist Party of China employs a whole government approach using political, economic, and military tools, as well as a vast propaganda machine to garner the support and influence necessary to reshape relationships and gain accesses in the region that are more favorable, again, to the party's interests. The Communist Party of China is looking to change the world order to one where Chinese national power is more important than international law, a system where the strong do what they will and the weak do what they must. Indeed, we, not just the United States, but all nations, we are in a strategic competition between a Beijing central regional order and, as I said, the idea of a free and open Indo-Pacific. The clear, hold, build paradigm of the last three decades will not serve as a blueprint for doctrinal and capability development for this new competition. And as we saw with the airland battle transformation, the process through which new concepts mature requires a similar revolution in tactical development, technology, and training today. A new warfighting concept must deliver a similar sense of assurance to our allies and partners today that air land battle provided to the NATO member states in Europe in the 70s and 80s. It must demonstrate the capability, the capacity, and the will to deny the adversary's objectives in competition and crisis and if deterrence fails, again, to fight and win. The fundamental design behind the evolving warfighting concept must be an integrated joint force that can deny an adversary's ability to dominate in the sea, air, land, space, and cyber domains and support its own ability to dominate in the same. It requires a more distributed joint position across the Indo-Pacific 
And that posture must have the sustainment and force protection to be resilient, survivable, and supportable. In the Indo-Pacific, our joint force must more fully integrate its special operation forces, its cyber capabilities, space forces, and ground forces equipped with long-range fires to present an effective deterrent that holds an adversary and all that adversary holds dear at risk. It is not enough to play defense. I often say catching missiles with missiles is the hardest thing that we do. An Indo-Pacific warfighting concept must have a strong offense as well. This integrated joint force must have the capability to pose multiple dilemmas to the adversary as well. And opposed to an ad hoc joint force shaped to respond to crisis, excuse me, the integrated joint force must have the capability to pose multiple dilemmas to the adversary as well. And as opposed to an ad hoc joint force shaped to respond to a crisis only after it occurs. Simply put, this requires us to continue to advance our jointness, not only in crisis, but in the day-to-day -day and in the transition to crisis as well. In the past, we could afford to integrate from time to time. Today, we must be fully interoperable across all domains, all the time. An Indo-Pacific warfighting concept will assure our allies and ensure continued access to the global system and the markets therein. This is how our deterrent strategy must continue to underwrite the rules-based international order from which this nation's and so many of our allies and partners' prosperity comes from. In order to achieve this level of deterrence, our investments must harness the advanced capabilities provided by a network of leading-edge technologies, such as integrated air and missile defenses, these that employ multiple sensors and interceptors distributed across the region to protect not only the homeland, including U.S. territories forward, but also our U.S. forces. These integrated air and missile defenses must leverage, integrate, and protect our critical allies and partners as well. And they must, and they, our allies and partners, must invest here too. Long-range precision strike capabilities from across all platforms, services, and domains to hold at risk a variety of target sets. Remember, multiple dilemmas. And from distances both in the clinch and from outside the ring. Joint command and control networks that provide speed and flexibility in decision making, which allow penetration and then disintegration of an adversary's systems and decision making processes, and thereby defeating their offensive capabilities and their situational awareness. Artificial intelligence, quantum computing, remote sensing, machine learning, big data analytics, and 5G technology will all be required for a well-designed architecture to ensure we are interoperable and compatible in our offensive and defensive capabilities. When combined, these technologies will drive the development of a joint fires network, the JADC2, if you must, which will provide fire control solutions and collaborative engagement opportunities across the entirety of the joint force. The design principles behind a joint fires network include decentralized architecture, automation of fire control functions, and a common operating picture across the joint force for our own asset management and weapon pairing needs. The joint fires network must enable the joint force to dominate across all domains at the times and places of our choosing, help us improve on our simultaneous and sequential operations and do it throughout an ever enlarging battle space. Now, with technology advances and tactical development, must go more advanced joint training capability and capacity. For its backbone, we need a joint, joint network of training ranges capable of meeting the exercise, experimentation, and innovation objectives of this new warfighting concept. 
Unfortunately, our current range test and or training facilities are built separately by each service, sometimes by their service test and development community, and rarely with the joint force in mind. Further, they are not funded to enable joint training. The joint force must have the ability to advance capability at scale through accessible, all domain, and integrated ranges that can support joint and combined training and exercises. We must all strongly advocate <clears throat> for a joint network of live, virtual, and constructive ranges in key locations around this region, but I would argue as well around the globe, to support joint and combined exercises, experimentation, and innovation. Indo-PACOM is home to and in close proximity to numerous service and national training testing and operational range, excuse me, operational ranges and related service facilities. Just some of the CONUS-based examples include the Western Range at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California, the Pacific Missile Test Center at Point Magoo, Nevada Test and Training Center at Nellis in Nevada, the National Training Center at Fort Irwin in California, and the Fallon Range Training Complex in Nevada as well. There are also several critical OCONUS facilities in the region. The Joint Pacific Alaska Range Complex, the J Park, provides an unmatched, realistic training environment and allows commanders to train for full spectrum engagements, large scale ops, and multinational training. The Pacific Missile Range Facility, PMRF, at Barking Sands in Hawaii is the world's largest instrumented multidimensional testing and training range, and the only range in the world where subsurface, surface, air, and space vehicles can operate and be tracked simultaneously. And when combined with PTA, the Pahokaloa Training Range on the Big Island, the only brigade-sized live fire training range west of California. It presents an incredible joint opportunity if we were able to merge these Navy-funded and Army-funded capabilities into a joint system. Lastly, the Reagan test site on the Kwajalein Atoll is uniquely qualified to support live missile testing and space surveillance operations due to its isolated location. Each of these facilities is optimized to fit a particular domain or a particular test or to gather information and provide feedback across a specific and usually quite narrow area of interest. The department must find a way to integrate and network these ranges to achieve the full potential of the new warfighting concept just as the National Training Center became a fully instrumented state-of-the-art training facility to realize the potential of air land battle. The only way to combat the security challenges we face in today's dynamic operating environment is through a continuous campaign of joint experimentation and high fidelity multi-domain training across the joint force. The evolution of innovative operational concepts, directed by the National Defense Strategy, by the way, cannot occur without the capability to execute rigorous experiments and the ability to take measured risks in the development of a more agile, integrated, and lethal force. Integrating our U.S. ranges in the region with allied ranges in Japan and Australia presents an opportunity as well. It would allow us to advance joint and combined capability and capacity in a fully instrumented, live, virtual, constructive proving ground, something our allies and partners don't have yet. An integrated U.S. and coalition force that regularly demonstrates operations across all domains and can do the training needed to present new challenges and dilemmas for potential adversaries would be incredibly powerful. Additionally, a joint range network provides us with the ability to reveal certain capabilities we want our adversaries to see and conceal the things we don't want them to see. This has got to be a major component of any strategy of deterrence. Part of that obligation would be to advance 
our joint and combined exercises within U.S. Indo-Pacific Command. Talisman Sabre is one of the premier military exercises in the region and has been increasing in complexity, size, and scope during each iteration. We must continue to build on that. There's no there in Talisman Sabre. The joint biennial exercise between the United States and Australia involves more than 30,000 people, and it's got to continue its evolution by integrating more cyber and space operations and more advanced threats into its scenarios. Keen Edge is another example. Keen Edge is our joint and bilateral exercise focused on the defense of Japan. The United States bilateral relationship with Japan continues and will continue to deepen. Our collaboration gets better and better month by month. We will continue to develop the integration required during high-end conflict. To collaborate, to collaborate more effectively and expeditiously between the U.S. Joint Force and the Japanese Self-Defense Forces. To overcome the information sharing challenges with our closest non-5i partner and to enhance the transparency needed to fight at the speed of conflict in the 21st century <clears throat> in the Western Pacific. Valiant Shield is our biennial exercise designed to further refine live fire test and evaluation of the evolving suite of net enabled weapons. This US only exercise features the services most advanced platforms and units. These include Marine F-35s, Navy P-8s, and the nascent multi, excuse me, Army Multi-Domain Task Force concept to come to test our ability to conduct joint-enabled assault forward in the Indo-Pacific. This complex training enables real-world proficiency in sustaining joint forces during the entirety of the detect to engage sequence and to employ precision munitions in all domains. Each iteration of Valiant Shield seeks to advance the independence of ISR, the distribution and decentralization of long-range precision strike, and the integration of shared set elements, the links, the electronic support measures, the voice networks that bring it all together in order to achieve more seamlessness and more simplicity in our joint integrated fires and command and control. In all, these three exercises and others must serve as the ideal setting where tactical development, training, and technology converge for the joint and combined force, necessary to deter and absolutely necessary to fight and win. So if I may, in closing, the U.S. must continue to seek its enormous advantages in technology development, in tactical development, the people, you in the audience, that put into the thinking of how we'll move forward tactically, and the training system of exercises and ranges to deliver on an Indo-Pacific warfighting concept that demonstrates its will, its capability, and its capacity to fight and win. At Indo-PACOM, we are working with the services throughout the Pentagon, our components, and indeed the Department and the Hill to get this right. One final note to everyone here in attendance. Your desire to innovate, to challenge, to discover, to think both critically and creatively, and most importantly, to act, is the key to ensuring our United States military continues to be the best in the world. I thank you for your time today and for your desire to advance our joint force capability in the future. May God bless the men and women of the United States Sea Service, every sailor, Marine, and Coast Guardsman, and may God bless the United States of America. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> I think I'm here to take some questions. Thank you. 
Thank you, Admiral. Uh, Pete Daly, Naval Institute. The service chiefs tend not to get up in the morning and think, what can I do for joint command and control today? Yeah. They have a lot on their plates. And with the, with the evolution that you described, which makes a lot of sense, do we need to go back and identify an agent for this activity, much like we had with uh, Joint Forces Command or maybe some version of that for the future? Uh, a, a joint component to do such a thing? Uh, uh, to tell you the truth, at this point, and, and given the, the bills that all the services, I think uh, they're trying to balance, um, it hasn't really come up in the conversation the last few months. Um, most of that responsibility resides within the joint staff uh, in the J7 uh, there. They do doctrinal development and, in fact, are working on a joint warfighting concept to have a due date at the end of the year. In tandem with that was the, the evolution of joint exercise funds, which were um, placed amongst all the combatant commanders before, um, but there's opportunity to you know, deepen that with all the other combatant commanders going forward. Um, knitting together, and there is plenty of opportunity for joint force exercises forward and you know, in the fourth generation process in CONUS and Hawaii and Alaska as well, um, to take advantage of that going forward. I, I think we need to seriously look at how we're evolving our joint funding for those exercises in order to make sure we're getting all we can out of it. Um, it's not enough to try to build on a service exercise, uh, although I would, you know, I have to applaud the Navy for one. I mean, RIMPAC is as joint as any exercise that the joint force um, uh, funds and, and runs under their command and control. Um, we have to look for opportunities there as well. Thank you. Admiral Mike Mann, um, retired SWO. Um, I greatly appreciate and totally agree with everything that you just said. But I think the coronavirus and the things that it has exposed about our vulnerability to China our supply chains, our medicine, everything else. If we did everything that you said you, you needed us to do, it still wouldn't solve the most fundamental problem. And that's the interconnectedness of our economies and our dependence on them for our supply chain. Mm -hmm. And this may sound like more of a statement. I don't know how to phrase the question, but how are we gonna get around that piece of it? Mm -hmm. You know, that's the thing that scares me. Mm -hmm. Well, this is, uh the, the difficulty in, in, uh, in contrasting it to the Soviet era, right? In the Soviet era, you, you definitely had uh, bifurcated economic systems on the globe um, with capitalism ultimately you know, dictating the outcome uh, that was to be. Now you have a truly uh, globally integrated economy. I think it's one of the reasons that it's so important that we deter a fight. All that said, I would say China's pernicious activity in the region is evident to the, to the point that you're starting to see some of that singular global supply chain come apart a little bit. Um, whether it was U.S. placement of the THAAD radar in Korea and Korea re relocating on the order of hundreds of businesses out of China, a bit of the unwinding you see uh, with, between Taiwan and the People's Republic of China right now, other just in my region alone, um, other desires by other nations in South Asia and Southeast East Asia to be tech leaders, um, you're gonna continue to see the global economy evolve. Um, to think that it's static uh, and unchanging, I, I think, um, is to be a little uh, short-sighted. Um, there, the wealth of population in Southeast Asia and South Asia that needs to be lifted out of poverty take advantage of some of the global economy. Um, that's the markets to come. And I think as a US strategic um, viewpoint, we need to be thinking of more diversity uh, anyway. And I think the global system is gonna allow it. Thanks, Mike. 
Hi, Admiral Sam Legrone from USNI News. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the changing dynamics of countries bordering the South China Sea, for example, uh, the political decision from the Philippines to uh, terminate the Visiting Forces Agreement, mm -hmm. um, EDCA, I think, is in threat, and then you know, uh, changing relationships, for example, with Vietnam. I, I, we understand that the TR is heading to Da Nang sometime this week. Um, can you talk a little bit about how those dynamics are changing sort of in that region, specifically in the South China Sea? Thank you. Um, you know, certainly uh, the Visiting Forces Agreement, the Department of Defense is working with uh, state right now to look at that notification by the Philippine government. You know, the Philippines has always been a long and steadfast, not always, but for 120 years now, has been a steadfast ally with the United States. And we have a shared history uh, between our peoples. It's, we have on the order of almost 100,000 U.S. veterans that live in the Philippines. And we have deep U.S. business interests there as well. Um, I would say that the military-to-military -military relationship with the Philippines is stronger than it's ever been and has been that way since 2017 when we assisted in the fight in Marawi. Um, we've got processes now, a bilateral strategic dialogue that culminates um, in four-star to four-star uh, um, uh, annual battle rhythm events to help advance that. So I need to let the department and the State Department work that, um, but I have the utmost faith in our Philippine alliance and uh, look forward to seeing that move forward together. You know, Vietnam, it's true, we do have uh, TR pulling into uh, Da Nang this week. Um, you know, there's, Vietnam is leading ASEAN this year um, some of the burden that falls to them is this code of conduct negotiation with the PRC um, for uh, the rules of the road, essentially, in um, South China Sea waters and elsewhere. Um, they've been um, quite vocal and supportive of U.S. freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea, and they've been quite vocal and supportive of the allies and partners that have come to operate in the international sea and airspace in the South China Seas pretty consistently over the course of the last 18 months or so. Um, so there, we're, I was quite impressed with Indonesia and their response to Chinese fishing fleet activities here in early January. Uh, it's not a secret that the U.S. alerted them to the movement of that force and the Chinese maritime militia, uh, and Indonesia responded with um, ships, F-16s, um, four deployed to Natuna Island, uh, and help set the conditions um, that established Indonesia's rights uh, to their waters and their EEZ. I see, in general, you know, affirming uh, in the region, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, the United States, France, operating India, operating independently or together in the South China Sea, um, clearly in undisputed waters for many of their case, very supportive of our freedom of navigation operations. And you see ASEAN uh, starting to rally around the eye that the, uh, the idea that uh, the code of conduct cannot limit them any more than uh, the UNCLOS uh, already established international norms in the sea, in the sea space. Um, so I'm quite pleased with the trajectory of things that are going on there. Thanks, Sam. Hi, Admiral Davidson, uh, Bob Ackerman. At Sea Signal Magazine. You've just described the need for us to establish a credible deterrence in that region when that has to be based on modern warfare and technology and capabilities. What do you see as the Achilles heel that could prevent or undo the effort to build that deterrence? Um, you know, I'll tell you what our critical advantage is. That's our network of allies and partners. Um, and China's very pernicious activity in the background. Uh, there's a lot of uh, corruption associated with it. They're buying off of political elites or business elites in other countries uh, could be a critical shortfall. That said, wherever I go, um, U.S. values, the values of the rules-based international order, competes extraordinarily well with large stacks of yuan. Um, we have to be willing to extend those values across the region, 
help our allies and partners stand up um, and be the kind of reliable presence in the region that we have been, you know, going back some 240 years now, and certainly over the last 75. We got to we got to stay on that approach. Well, obviously, they won't allow us to just do our deterrence the way we want. Uh, Same was true in the Soviet era. Do you think that they are the biggest problem, or are we ourselves the potential threat if we don't follow through? Well, I think the resiliency and the leadership that the United States has demonstrated really um, throughout the last 75 years um, is, is something that, in my experience in the region, wherever I go, people want to be with us. Um, and I think that's an incredibly powerful position to have. Thank you. Good afternoon, Dave, Admiral. Jim Harkins, United States Marine Corps, retired. I'm not into pie in the sky. We got drug into the Korean War because of a treaty. We got drug into Southeast Asia because of a treaty. Do you really think that we can respond when North Korea decides to come down and invade South Korea, when China decides it wants to take over Formosa or even invade Japan, that we are going to have the assets available locally at that time to deter that happening? Well, we've been able to deter uh, war on the Korean Peninsula now some 66 years, I think. Uh, not quite that, yeah, 66 years. Um, that's the length of our alliance and then some. We need to continue to stay after it. You know, there's challenges that happen on this planet every day. There's, there's no doubt about it. Uh, but the resiliency in the U.S.-Korean alliance, the things that we've uh, done and rehearsed together, the capability sets that we're putting in the space now, um, continue to maintain our position there. <clears throat> but do you believe that the nations involved in CETO and other Southeast Asian countries that are not involved in CETO are going to come to the assistance of the United States? Or do you think, and, and when we take the lead, they're going to be there supporting us? I think uh, wherever I go, I'm meeting with politicians, policymakers, senior uniformed leaders. They all directly state their will and commitment to the idea of a rules-based international order and they will be there to help defend against tyranny. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. Alan Philpott from uh, POC4I. Sir, looking into the future uh, in your role as the uh, commander for Indo-PACOM, what role do you see for unmanned surface vehicles? One of the challenges my organization faces now is working with Fleet Forces Command and surf to everyone one to define the CONOPS for how these vessels will operate and also to at the same time uh, develop derived requirements. We want to get this right. So what's your view of, the, of how unmanned surface vehicles will operate in the Pacific? Well, I mean, there's a, you know, a general concept behind what we're talking about here, which requires more distributed sensors, more distributed weapons, the connectivity that makes that all come about. Um, the opportunity in unmanned surface vessels, indeed. I mean, we're seeing this uh, in the air over the course of the last 20 years is a lesson. You can put sensing in the sky, um, you can put uh, weapons in the sky um, to close uh, understanding, um, to close a fires gap, and um, absolutely help advance your own tactics, operations, and strategy going forward. The same opportunity uh, is there in unmanned surface vessels as well. Thanks. Thank you. Getting the hook. So, Admiral Davidson, thank you for taking the time and, and coming here and visiting with us today. Uh, and thank you for laying out some of the capabilities and the needs from, from your perspective as a commander of the Indo Pacific Command. You very did a gr good job characterizing China uh, from the high level. And I think we all need to dig down and get a better understanding that goes well beyond this, too. The, 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 the topic of joint fires, the joint exercises going beyond joint into the coalition and having those training ranges out there. Where you could, it's not just training, it's an interoperability issue yeah. too, as well as developing the confidence you said. So thank you very much for, for being here today. And on behalf of FCA and USNI, I'd like to present you with a token of our gratitude, a copy of the Chinese Communist Espionage and Intelligence Primer by Peter Mattis and Matthew Brazil. And inside you'll find an FCA book 
bookmark. You could probably write this book. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very Thank much, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.